The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Krista Brown with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar on public awareness, tools and tips for APS programs with some very special presenters who I will introduce shortly. Next slide. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit of information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide, please. The APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on the use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies, and providing technical assistance to APS programs. Essentially, we're here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Next slide. And just a quick announcement, we're excited about Let's Talk APS, announcing a new format for monthly peer support discussions starting October 2022. So the APS TARC will now be hosting two informal collaborative peer calls each month via Microsoft Teams, one on practice and one on program management. Watch out for announcements with more information and how to register. And you can also give us uh, meeting topics using the APS TARC contact desk form on the slide. Next slide. And also a reminder that the National Adult Protective Services Training Center, NATC, has launched. And the no-cost APS core program e-learning courses are available for APS professionals to access. Please visit the website on the slide for additional information. Next slide. Now to some housekeeping handouts. Handout section of your webinar control panel, you will find today's slides and you can download these at any time. Please go ahead and use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar and you can control uh, the speaker volume there. If you experience audio problems due to internet connection speeds or hardware issues, we recommend that you go ahead and exit, log out and log back in. Next slide, please. You may ask questions, share comments by typing them into the questions box at any time during the webinar, and we will try to relay as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the, the webinar at the end. This webinar is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email when uh, the uh, recording and slides are up on the TARC website. Everyone attending today will receive an email in about 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And then also be sure to take that brief eval survey when prompted. We'd love to hear your feedback. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our presenters today. First, we'll hear from Andrew Capehart, Senior Business Analyst, Subject Matter Expert with the APS TARC, WRMA Incorporated. Then we'll hear from Alicia Cisneros, Outreach Coordinator with the National Center on Elder Abuse. And then we'll move into a facilitated discussion with Robin Tejeda, Social Services Manager 2 with the Nevada Department of Health and Human Services, Aging and Disability Services Division, Adult Protective Services, and Tawny Smith-Savage, Social Services Department Coordinator with the Fond du Lac Reservation Human Services Division. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Andy, and he's going to take it away. Thank you so much, Krista. Um, and thanks to all of our presenters for participating today. We have a really good lineup for you. Um, so I'm just going to set the stage a little bit. We're seeing more public awareness in the APS world these days than we really ever have before, um, mostly thanks to the APS Formula Grant Funds. We've been working here at the APS TARC to support state's public awareness efforts this year by releasing a toolkit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, but more than 40 of the recently published APS operational plans reference public awareness in some way, shape, or form. Um, that's a really big number. We were surprised at that. Some programs are raising awareness with the general public um, using advertisements on radio and television. Others are spending funds to target mandatory reporters only, um, as nearly all states have certain individuals, of course, that are required to report adult maltreatment. 
Um, we know of states engaging in activities from distributing flyers and posters or signs all the way to larger outreach events and state conferences and even radio and TV ads, as I mentioned earlier, which is pretty exciting. So I'd like to read this quote from Dr. George, Dr. Georgia Annitzberger, um, a well-known researcher in APS that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, who recently wrote a blog for the APS Dark. Um, Public awareness and professional recognition of elder abuse have increased. Still, there is evidence of awareness and recognition everywhere. I see it daily with growth in the number of Google Alerts, news feeds I receive about elder abuse, and my inability recently to find anyone who has not heard, at least heard, of the problem. I think this quote hits home for uh, many of us in APS. Our issue I feel used to fly under the radar quite a bit and didn't receive much attention. I think those days are basically over. Um, while there needs to be more recognition still for elder justice in general, um, it is the, uh, it's much more in the public spotlight than it used to be, um, which you will see on this next slide. This Google Trends graph isn't really earth shattering, but, but it is interesting. Um, here you see the weekly popularity scores for the search term adult protective services, quote unquote, from 2017 to 2022. There have been times in this graph uh, prior to 2022 where the score was higher than it's been this year, but you'll notice after the red line that you see here, that there's been no time where the score dipped below 60, which is why I think this graph is remarkable. Um, it may not demonstrate a sharp increase, but it does demonstrate a more sustained high score for Google searches on adult protective services, which I think is, is pretty fascinating. So given the increase in public awareness efforts, the APS TARC developed a public awareness toolkit for programs um, this year. In the toolkit, you'll find a brief that addresses strategies for success. It details benefits and risks, actually, of public awareness and tips for planning a campaign, including uh, materials that you might include in your campaign. We have a webinar on reframing elder abuse, which our NCEA colleague will speak to a bit here shortly. Uh, flyers and presentations from the Department of Justice Elder Justice Initiative. We have resources for, <clears throat> excuse me, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, again from our colleagues, the National Center on Elder Abuse. And possibly of great interest to many, we have examples of campaign materials from other programs throughout the country, and you'll hear from some of the folks today who are actually featured in that section. Um, we hope you find the toolkit helpful. Let us know what you think of it. Here's the link um, where you can get to it on our website, or you can just Google APS TARC, T-A-R-C, and go to our toolkits page to find it. So with that, I will turn things over to uh, Alicia Cisneros with the National Center on Elder Abuse to talk about reframing public awareness. Thank you. I am so excited to be here today and to be talking with you all. My name is Alicia um, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator over at the National Center on Elder Abuse. Um, I'll just briefly introduce us um, for a quick second here on the next slide. Next, there it is already. Um, so uh, what we do at the National Center is a, a, we're a resource center. We're really focused on information around elder abuse prevention. And we do that um, by sharing um, the newest policies, research, training, news, and resources um, to help um, our colleagues and the lay public with elder abuse prevention information. And our next slide here. I also want to share that the NCEA is the home of the Reframing Elder Abuse Project. Now, this is my favorite project. It's our a new communication tool that we have used to expand and make our outreach efforts more effective. Um, I wanna share some lessons that we've are, at our team have learned um, in applying this communication style into our materials. Now, um, one of the lessons that we've learned is to not assign people or groups of folks as vulnerable or victims or in need of protection, right? That kind of starts to cloud our messaging, and that's what we've really learned over at the National Center on Elder Abuse. Um, sure, sometimes we have to use the word vulnerable, but assigning that to a person starts to make it a little difficult to connect with somebody, right? The next thing that we've learned is um, to always use photos of folks looking at the camera and of older couples. I see, um, and we talked a lot about this during Valentine's Day, um, when we see folks um, in these uh, public awareness campaigns about elder abuse prevention um, or awareness in APS tools, we see people looking away from the camera. Um, I know the looking down at your hands is a really popular one that we've seen. 
Um, and when we're talking about support systems or um, families, we very, very um, rarely see um, images of older couples or older couples that are thriving and aging um, with dignity and respect. Um, so I would very much encourage folks to use um, those images in your outreach uh, materials. I also want to remind everybody to um, keep our materials accessible, something that we've been um, uh, working with our, um, our um, materials at the NCEA and making sure everything um, is accessible is using that 508 um, compliance tool and make sure that we have updates um, done, whether that's with somebody from your own team who's able to do that or if you could find a contractor to do that. Uh, that way um, you are able to reach more audiences. On the next slide, I have a few more tips. Um, I really want to point out and make um, some time here to talk about outreach on social media. Social media is so powerful. Um, and we've learned that it's so important to continue to use that reframing communication tool on all of our social media platforms, um, whether it be through the images, through our posts, the way that we interact with our colleagues and other um, folks in the lay public on social media. Um, we've really gotten into the hashtag trends, making sure that we can um, be a part of whatever the trending conversation is of the month or week. There's always um, a new awareness day. October is full of awareness days. We've got Guardianship Awareness Month, Residents' Rights um, Awareness Month, Cybersecurity um, Awareness Month, um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So um, we wanna use those hashtags. What, what hashtags are our colleagues using? What hashtags are the lay public using? And once you use that hashtag, you become a part of the conversation. So if I was on Twitter and I typed in hashtag elder abuse prevention, everybody who's used that hashtag or is using or is talking about elder abuse prevention is gonna come up there, right? And so then that makes, um, makes you a part of a bigger conversation and then you start to make other connections um, through that tool. I also um, love social media toolkits and I've been seeing this a lot with our partners. Um, we have them as well, especially for WEAD and I'll talk about that in a second. But toolkits that are have images already ready to go for you. So if I wanted to um, get involved in Residence Rights Month, I'd go over to the Consumer Voice. They already have a toolkit ready. I'll use the image that they've already made for me and the, the post that they would like for me to use. Make sure that it's reframed, doesn't have any, um, it almost never does, but doesn't make sure that doesn't have anything about um, somebody being vulnerable or any paternalistic re, uh, that's and language that's not reframed. And I would start to integrate that into our outreach as well. So then we get part of we get into that part of the conversation as well. If you have the budget, Twitter ads are the best tool. Um, here you're, you're going to put a certain amount of money into each post that you write to expand on whether you want somebody to click a specific ad maybe you have um, a new a new publication out or you just want to get eyes on your message maybe you're saying um, this is this is our new APS um, line make sure you're calling the line these are the signs to know to before you call us um, then you can you can gear your ad that way they, they, these of course are paid and they would need to be in your budget, but if you have the budget, they are just a wonderful tool. Alrighty, on the next slide here, um, before we start to get into examples, I wanna show you all kind of what the NCAA team does when we're starting to put together some outreach materials. So we work with these steps um, from the structure of justice narrative into all of our outreach for reframed communication. This narrative provides communicators with a step-by-step -step strategy to engage more productively with the public by highlighting the causes, the consequences, and the solutions to elder abuse prevention and elder abuse and prevention. And we really want to highlight those solutions, right? So the structure of justice comes in three steps that you can really integrate and kind of customize based on um, your audience and what you're gearing towards. So the first step is why does the issue matter? So why does elder abuse matter? We're really highlighting the value piece to promote a collective responsibility. Um, why do we want justice for all? Well, we're all aging and we're all gonna need these resources as we age. So it's on all of us to prevent elder abuse. The step two, is um, to highlight social structures. How does this work? 
what's not working and how are we all accountable? So now we're like bringing in a metaphor here, right, on the structure as an example to focus on risk factors. How do we keep all these beams of a building working together to hold us up? If you're missing a beam out of a building, we're gonna have a problem. It's probably not a safe building. So now we have an image in our mind. Step three is to create collective and concrete solutions to avoid the idea of fatalism, that nothing can be done and raise support for community resources. So we have here an example. What's the solution? Policies and programs. We want those APS programs. We want them strong. We want them funded and we want them staffed. And here's all these, this structure here that we have our um, example of George here. He's on this uh, very stable, sturdy structure because he's got the policies and programs in his community to lift him up and keep him in a um, stable situation that he can age with dignity and respect in. These images here are our PSA example of our friend George. Um, you can see that PSA example and how we've worked this justice narrative um, with that link there on the bottom right hand side. Alrighty, so let's talk about um, examples with our big campaign um, for WEAD on our next slide. We try to do a number of campaigns. This is our biggest campaign, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. And I wanted to just kind of highlight for a second here what um, these images might look like and how we really try to um, integrate everything that we've talked about today into our campaigns. So this is on our social media campaign. Um, here, we don't really have um, too many images of anybody, right? What you see that's bigger is um, our actual messaging, right? inform and be informed advocates of all ages can prevent elder abuse right so we have a collective um a collective solutions approach in that messaging right over here we say world elder abuse awareness day is june 15th we didn't talk about um anything paternalistic right um, um uh, abuse abuse is a part of aging we need to do something about it that's not on here right we don't have anything that's like that if you're older you're vulnerable we don't have anything like that on here so we really want to put this as more of um, an awareness something that's short and sweet if we want to expand we can expand on the post saying um, know the signs of abuse check out this link here um, it's on all of us to prevent elder abuse there we didn't talk anything about vulnerability. We didn't talk anything about um, anything paternalistic. And that really is um, pulling people in. I also wanna highlight the hashtag here, um, keeping people involved in the same conversation, bringing in that hashtag we add and we put it on our images as well so that everybody knows um, whether it's our partners or people in the lay public who wanna talk about World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, they use the hashtag and then um, we can all be a part of that same conversation when you look up the hashtag on whatever social media site. It's also great later on for analytics. If I want to see everybody who's talked about we add and I'm gathering analytics to find out what worked and what didn't work for next year's campaign, um, I could see that with the hashtag. Alrighty, on the next slide, I wanted to show you um, some befores and after examples for our actual publications that we also share. And we share these about everywhere on social media, during webinars, when we are at conferences, when we are at events in the community. Now this is our before image um, or our before example of our red flags of abuse. This is our most popular um, outreach uh, publication and it highlights things that you should be aware of. Now, right off the bat, um, we can see examples of what I was saying earlier, right? People not looking at the camera, somebody covering their face. We've got um, the hands um, here. We don't really see anybody looking in the camera. We see people um, who appear to be alone. If you um, look at, if we zoom into the words, the wording on the right-hand side, we see a lot of um, language about victims and vulnerable and really putting a, um, a tag on folks, right? Um, and it's very paternalistic, you know, um, unable to comprehend. So there's a different way to say this, and I'm gonna show you on the next slide here. All right, we took out all those photos, right? They were very distracting, unnecessary, and it's blocking our communications. We want people to hear what we have to say. So 
we changed that, took those images out, and if you zoom in to what we have here and take a closer look on the right-hand side, you can see that we started to put in that um, structure of justice narrative. Um, we are telling folks about the, that imaging, the construction project, that people's, we need to highlight people's safety and well-being. And um, we want, to, we have that collective approach at the end. Everyone at every age deserves justice. Um, and then if you look at the bullets, we took out all of that paternalistic language, everything about um, folks, labeling folks as victims and vulnerable. And we highlighted the message that we want to get through. These are the financial signs. Keep an eye out on them. Keep an eye on, on, on them if no matter what age you are, because we are all in this, right? We're all aging. We all need to be aware of this so that we can all age with dignity and respect. And that's really what we're getting to the point here in this outreach piece. So on the next slide, we have one more that we actually recently, that's a little more recent, um, that we updated, um, something known as the grandparent scam. Now, right off the bat, this kind of makes me, when I was looking through our publications, I was thinking, that's kind of tough, right? Not everybody who is aging is a grandparent. That kind of, I feel like, pulls somebody out of your um, awareness material right away. Um, we're talking about um, somebody being targeted. And so it, there's some some um, some language here that's gonna block our communications. You see somebody looking away from the phone. She looks concerned on the phone. Um, she's not looking at the camera. She, it doesn't look like she has any, um, um, any independence in this photo, right? She doesn't look like she has any um, she doesn't look like she's she's really engaging here. In the next photo here, we're gonna remove that distraction and this distractive language on the next slide. And we're just gonna have the image of the phone. It's decoration, it's not taking away from what we're trying to say. We're gonna focus in, if we don't need to call it a grandparent scam, it's a phone scam and we can focus on what exactly that is so that folks aren't feeling um, folks aren't feeling pulled back by our message, right? We want people to really want to continue to read on right off the bat. Um, we are, we do want to be involved in the conversation because typically phone scams are called grandparent scams. So we just put it in the sentence as to not to take, as to not take away from what we're trying to tell folks, right? We're pulling out that paternalistic messaging. And, and this is something that we just did recently and we've been doing the re reframing project for quite a while. So there's always room to continue to reframe and grow um, our materials. Um, so you might be thinking, uh, Alicia, you know what? I don't have time to be reframing all of my stuff. Outreach is already going to be a project as it is. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed about these suggestions that you're giving. Don't worry about it. We have your back. On the next slide, you'll see our, stu our steep customizable toolkit. This is a toolkit that um, is already reframed, ready to go. All you have to do is um, put in your, your logo. We've also have social media images that you can add on to um, your social media outreach as well. You can see those on the next slide. Um, you see the images on the right hand side. These are already ready to go for social media. The images on the left hand side, you can see that there's a space there for your agency's name. They're already ready to go for you to print insert your logo, your name, and you're good to go. Next slide. Here we go, a closer look at those social media images. Nothing that has anybody appearing vulnerable or appearing um, like they're not engaging with the materials. Next slide. Here we go again, more graphics. And our next slide here. And then a closer look here at the brochures where you can put your information. So you're good to go. Next slide. Alrighty, and so before we go, I just want to highlight how much I love this public awareness toolkit because it's so comprehensive and those tools are so important for outreach. And it public awareness is, I mean, I might be biased because I'm our outreach coordinator, but I just think it's such a powerful way to increase engagement in elder justice initiatives and awareness for APS services. So um, some quick reminders to just plan ahead with your campaigns. It does take a lot of work. Think about staffing, 
um, on the next slide, I want to highlight um, to rem I want to highlight um, reminding yourself about your budget. What do you have? What can you plan ahead to do? Um, what kind of staffing do you have to be able to do this? Um, I would give your time, your team, plenty of time to plan your campaign. Um, we usually try to plan um, our campaigns four to five months in advance, just so that there's plenty of time to um, dedicate to your campaign in addition to everything else that you're doing as well. Um, so I know that was a lot of information to, for today. So on the next slide, I have um, a printable um, toolkit. We usually print these and put them on our computers or in our notebooks, just to remind ourselves of some of the things to help advance our communications. You're welcome to print it as well. And then on the next slide, I have some last minute reminders of the lessons that we at the NCEA have learned, reminding everybody to use the we, us, all, a collective approach to avoid those triggering images or um, um, uh, uh, labeling folks as vulnerable. Reminder to use that first person language and to really highlight those solutions. And then I always say, if you don't need to reinvent the wheel, um, then you have something that's already ready to go with that steep toolkit and the other resources that we have here on our next slide. Um, and these are all ready for you. We got the Talking Elder Abuse Toolkit if you'd like to learn more about the Reframing Elder, um, Elder Abuse Project. Um, there's also a free online course if you use the code NCEA Elder Justice. We also throw out um, uh, to our um, subscribers monthly tips um, about the Reframing Elder Abuse uh, Project. So I try to keep up of what's what's everybody talking about what can people use a tip for? There's always something that um, is trending and I wanna make sure that we can give you tips on how to join those conversations. So um, that's where you can subscribe there. We also have our sister project, the Reframing Aging Init Initiative. Um, and they are a similar project, but they really focus on the aging aspect instead of the elder abuse aspect. Um, and then we also have all of our um, resources that I mentioned today on there as well, the PSA, the red flags uh, flyer, 12 things we can all do to prevent elder abuse and the steep toolkit. I know that was a lot, so if you have any questions, um, my information, um, our contact information is on the next slide. And um, I've so appreciated uh, being able to talk with you all today. And I'll pass it back to the team. Thank you, Alicia. Um, before we jump uh, with our facilitated discussion, I, there's two questions that you probably can answer very quickly. Um, are uh, are the resources uh, in the steep and others uh, are they available in various language and even Braille? We've been working with the um, Braille Institute to get to get some of these resources um, in Braille. Let me double check our. I believe. Let's see here. I can I can check in with the team on those. I'm looking at them now. I know we have quite a few um, outreach materials that are in multiple language, but the actual fillable ones, I need to get back to you on. Um, if okay. you can maybe put your information in the chat, yeah. Great. I can share. Um, or or would it be better that um, the uh, the person just contact NCEA and reach out? That, that way? works too. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. And then Good. the next question is, when you reference paternalistic, what do you mean? When I reference paternalistic, I mean like, um, I'm thinking of a quick example. Um, keep an eye, keep an eye on older adults' finances as they age because uh, they can become confused and uh, need support to manage finances. That kind of sounds like something that uh, a parent would say about maybe their teenager, right? And we don't need that. Maybe a better way to say that would be, um, we should all keep an eye on um, financial scams. Here's some examples of what we can all do to be aware of um, financial scams or to plan ahead um, for our, to protect our financial needs learn more with these resources or how to report financial um, abuse, right? So we never said this person needs to be protected, this person needs to be watched out for, right? We said, let's all keep an eye on this because then that applies to all of your audiences instead of 
um, maybe just um, caregivers, right? Now we're thinking about all of us and we're all doing this together and we're all aging. So we should all be engaging in these preventative resources. Great. Thank you for that quick um, example, Alicia. Thinking on your feet. Of course. <laughs> Now we're going to turn it on over to um, Andy and Robin and Tani for a facilitated discussion, and then we'll have time for more questions. Thank you so much, Krista. So we're going to kind of go round robin a little bit between our two <clears throat> panelists today and discuss some of their program experiences. So I think that I will dive right in. Um, what factors led you to engage in a public awareness campaign? Who would like to take that first? I can I can start, Andy. This is Robin. Um, we've always here in Nevada. We've always had a um, you know public awareness campaign, if you will. Um, but we were able to make it more robust um, in 2019 with our expansion from Elder Protective Services to Adult Protective Services. We had a grant through ACL, and so we had um, you know some budget support with the campaign through that. And then we continued our awareness campaign with an additional grant that from ACL for opioid misuse awareness. Um, so that's kind of what contributed to where we are now with our campaign. Great. Thank you, Robin. Tony, do you um, want to chime in on this question? Sure. Um, so the factors that led our agency to engage in a public awareness campaign um, was the new funding made available to us in Minnesota. It was um, earmarked for tribes through the Administration for Community Living, which mm -hmm. is very new to us. Um, the Fond du Lac Band of Ojibwe lies adjacent to county and state agencies. Um, and they're considered the lead agency for um, making uh, mandated reports. Um, so what we decided to do was um, create a public awareness campaign that was geared to the general public, um, especially our tribal community members um, who would pass by, you know, um, an area where there are a lot of different billboards um, of tribal uh, of businesses and tribal businesses in the community in the local community. Um, in the past, our community public health nurses were really successful in using the billboards to encourage healthy food choices, um, healthy living. So what our uh, department did was we utilized the new funding to bring attention to the need to check on elders, um, especially during COVID-19, and then also to provide a phone number um, so that we could um, be a center point to, for taking calls, um, getting information out about how to make a report and bring concerns forward. Great, thanks, Tony. And I think both of these campaigns used billboards, which we have a slide here in a bit. We can show those billboards to everybody, so you have an example of it. I think they're also available in our in our toolkit that we mentioned earlier. So thank you both for that. Um, moving on to our second question: What planning process and stakeholders did you engage for your campaign? Let's again, Andy. Um, yeah. Oh. yeah, I keep calling you Andy, Andrew. Sorry. Um, That's okay. Either one. We created what the first speaker was talking about, um, Alicia, about understanding your time constraints with your staff. And the public awareness campaign is, um, you know, it's a, it's an undertaking. It's, it can be time consuming. So we opted to utilize an outside resource. Um, we partnered with a company called KPS3 here in Nevada. Um, they're a media company because although we're experts on adult protective services, we're we're not certainly experts on media campaigning. And um, so we partnered with them right at the start. Um, we partnered with some of our law enforcement first responder um, partners that we have here to be in part, um, some of our videos that we, the PSA videos that we created. Um, and then we also collaborated with um, CASAT, which is the Comprehensive Alcohol and Substance Abuse Treatment. Um, they're housed here at the University in Reno. Um, and yeah, that's that's who we've engaged at first, and um, we had you know meetings and uh, just kind of brainstorming sessions, like what we wanted it to, to look like. But those were our, our and then the internal staff; those were our main partners. 
Thanks, Robin. I'm sure that was really helpful because we all know APS programs have plenty to do, and it's hard to you know start from scratch when you when you um, are dealing with something like a, a public awareness campaign that you may not be familiar with. So, um, Tony, would you like to chime in on this one? Um, sure. So I was the main uh, planning person on this, um, and our time frame was very short. Um, such was the what happened with COVID-19 uh, funds. So um, what I did really quickly was um, did, a, did some Google searching and researching um, images and content um, around elder protection, um, elder abuse. Um, so I did a lot of the planning. Um, what I ended up doing was uh, engage stakeholders um, as I went along. Um, one of the things that we had seen in our community um, was a very successful campaign involving a local photographer um, and artist in the area. So she is well respected for her approach in working with elders and the community around social engagement and then also obtaining permission in her work in the tribal community. So that buy-in is very important um, to just be able to um, utilize some of the images. Um, it was important to portray resilience so that the intent of safety and support um, could be really underscored. Um, additionally, the state of Minnesota had contracted with um, a consulting service called Onaway, who assisted with some messaging. Um, and again, this was really new to me. And um, since I've been on this webinar, I've learned already a lot about TARC and CEIA. Um, and I plan to do more research on this because this is a very good way to, um, you know, cut, I guess, a lot of the work out and go to these toolkits. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Tony. And I've seen these billboards. We'll show them in a minute. The The photography was, was pretty stunning. It was very, very good. So it sounds like both of you had a little bit, at least, of outside help. I'm sure that was, was very helpful. Um, moving on to our third question, have you used any methods to measure the impact of your campaign? Uh, Robin, would you like to go first? Oh, sure. So I thought this was a great question. And, um, you know, prior to calling into this presentation, I spoke to our our APS chief Tammy and we we're talking about that we don't collect um, you know, specific data on where people heard about APS. Um, more we collect data on who the reporting party is. But the things that we're able to track with the help of APS3 is they send us a, a monthly kind of snapshot of where we're getting traffic from our campaigns because um, we have um, some, that face, so some stuff on Facebook and Google and our APS 211 site for the expansion or this campaign, we're still engaged in that and moving that forward. And then we have another campaign with the opioid misuse awareness campaign. And so we get a different print, um, a different printout, if you will, or uh, information sent to us about, you know, average time on a page, um, unique events, like what people were searching maybe to get to where they were. Um, and uh, if something unique for some reason this month for the opioid misuse campaign, um, we have a video with one of our workers, her name's Courtney Wilson. And um, her, for some reason in July, we had like 115% increase in traffic oh, for, wow. her, for her um, video. Um, so they just kind of give us unique things that are happening with both of these um, campaign, which is obviously really interesting to us to see where people are searching and clicking and you know it'd be easy to use this for future campaigns like where we want to use our resources like what gets the most traffic um, so in terms of tracking that's all that we that's all that we have we don't know if like these campaigns are specifically increase, increasing the reports that we receive we assume sure. um, there's no mechanism in our current system to click like, how did you hear about APS? <laughs> you know, so right. uh, that answered your question. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Tony, how about you? Do you have any input on this one? So what we did, um, it, we started with the overall goals and objectives for this project. Um, which was basically um, to start with the, a new uh, Fond du Lac APS team to share ideas for developing strategies for improving coordination among tribal departments and non-tribal entities that have a role 
um, in uh, APS. And so this was just a part of our lar larger goal um, and just one of our objectives. So um, what I tried to do then was to um, see what employees were saying. Um, because we live in a small community, I'm able to you know, identify people who um, might be watching social media, um, offering some anecdotal feedback, um, I know that we provide um, employment to um, a, lar a large amount of community members. And so I knew that the number of people um, going by in vehicles, passing the billboards, um, this was considered interaction, although passive. Um, it was a good way to, um, I guess, help staff really who take calls, um, um, ask about noticing some of the billboards, and then also attaching that possibly to um, other campaign goals um, where we're using the pictures on brochures um, and trying to bring the concept together uh, and preventing elder abuse um, as well as using some of the images um, in other tools and handouts at conferences or other um, outreach events. So really a lot of our feedback was anecdotal, but really trying to um, make um, you know some of the artwork really stand out and um, be a branding towards um, what our overall goal was. Sure, yeah, and it sounds like you have, you had, being in a smaller community, you had an opportunity that, you know, in a larger area, they might not have to actually hear more about, you know, how the impact shook out for everybody and not necessarily numbers for everything. So um, I think that's you know, important to note about a, a smaller area, how you can get that kind of feedback. And if you look at the toolkit that we mentioned earlier, it does have some suggestions for measuring the impact of your campaign. <clears throat> there were, I was surprised to find when we did the research for that toolkit that there are some measurements that billboards can provide. There, there are some actual metrics that, that they can provide depending on the company that you go with. And um, if you're doing something on the web, um, you can certainly find all kinds of uh, stats from, you know, how many links were clicked, which links were clicked, what pages were visited, how long um, people were on a given page for a certain amount of time. Um, so there are some really good good measurements for, you know, billboards and, and websites for sure. So thank you both for that. Um, moving on to our fourth and last question, what tips, tricks, or advice can you share to others considering or engaging in a public awareness campaign? Um, Robin, would you like to go first? I think going in with the knowledge that campaigns, whether you hire a company or not, um, are very time consuming and staff labor intensive. Um, to be patient and flexible. For example, we wanted to put our ads like on Google searches for opioid, um, and we just kept hitting roadblocks because for some reason opioid is not a good word on Google. And so we had a hard time getting around those roadblocks to allow our campaign to be available there. So being flexible and um, changing directions if you need to. Um, collaboration with um, the correct key partners. Um, and I, I can't stress enough if you can have the budget to do it to work with, you know, um, a professional company that, uh, sorry, I think it says that I'm experiencing network connection difficulties. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, it sounds it sounds good, actually. Okay, sorry. That's why I stopped talking. I was like, uh oh. That's okay. Um, so to work with that outside company if you you can, because you know they were provide us a lot of expertise and things that we might not have thought about, um, mm -hmm. because that's what they do. Um, we learned from the expand. We call it the expansion campaign for us when we went from EPS to APS to our continuation of the opioid misuse campaign to um, a smaller team might be better because uh, we brought everyone to the table for the expansion and there was lots of opinions and we are slower moving. So making sure you have the right people at the table to make those decisions so things can move forward more seamlessly and timely. Um, let me see what else. And have a clear vision of what you want out of your campaign. Um, going forward, like what does your messaging want to be? Um, some of the same things that Alicia talked about, being intentional with words and pictures and things like that, because sometimes some of the things that came back from the campaign company, company were like, oh, that's not, you know, that visually that's not what we were thinking. And like going back until we were sure that that's what we wanted and then and the words associated with things. Um, 
and I think that you know intentionality, making sure that the message is clear. Uh, sure. And, yeah. You know, we were really excited. You know, now we have posters and brochures in color and wallet wallet cards and billboards and PSAs on radio and you know video. Um, so it's been a really exciting you know adventure, and that we're grateful that we were able you know to enhance our campaign here in Nevada. I think the the flexibility piece that you mentioned is pretty important. Um, you know, there's there's always you could run into roadblocks, and you have to figure out how to to deal with those, and you know, things that you didn't anticipate. So, it's a really good tip. Um, Tony, any tips, tricks, or advice you have? Sure. I um I thought about this, and I thought, well, let's let's see what's most important. And I think for me, um, identifying that overall goal and objective. Um, and deciding that I was going to use an artist to create that message. Um, and then two, um, knowing that resi resilience is powerful. Um, hel helping people know that they can make a difference in an elder's life. That was really the message um, I really wanted to make sure was there. Um, and then three, use a message that is short, powerful, and engaging. So, I mean, I would sit in the car and kind of think, like, what is a good phrase? You know, how do we start this out? And um, so I spent a lot of time looking at billboards <laughs> and sure. seeing what I liked, you know. Um, and then the fourth thing, um, look at other forms of outreach in the community um, and see if you can draw some reference to some of the good billboards and the messaging um, and then start a conversation around some of the the um, positive um, sides of like doing outreach to elders and really taking care of your community and it's got to be exciting to you know see this come to to fruition after you've done all that thinking and and see it come out in in action um, it's got to be really Really exciting. And here we have the billboards that were used in Nevada. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you want to say, Robin, about these. Um, sure. Uh, we were happy to use an internal staff member. This is so we're proud of this billboard for many reasons that we can have, you know, have it. These two particular ones are in our southern region. These are in Las Vegas. Um, we have we're still working on getting the ones up here in northern Nevada. And um, Tammy's going to kill me, but she's on the phone <laughs> listening. Um, and this is Tammy's big dream to have a, a billboard to get our message out and, you know, to have a way for people to know how to report to us if, you know, they're incurring, uh, encountering abuse. So you can see her tiny bit at the bottom in the red sweatshirt, but that's her excitement of our billboard. So, um, and these are really well received. Um, for some reason, Courtney. She's well received in the billboards and the videos and the PSAs. Um, so um, it's kind of fun having an internal staff member be a part you it know, is. the base to the campaign like this. Yeah, sure. And I believe that a lot of the materials with the campaign are available on our on our website in conjunction with the, the toolkit that we published and mentioned earlier. That's when you were talking earlier and they're there, they're not the billboard, but our other stuff. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, exactly. Thanks for sharing those. And Tony, here's some photos of your billboards. Anything you want to say about these? Um, yes, I would just like to, um, you know, thank the elders that were on these billboards and um, they did an awesome job, you know, just being who they are. One of them is our doctor, um, Arnie Vinio, um, well-respected um, individual. He actually does, um, something called native report and takes a few minutes to kind of talk a little bit about health and wellness um, during these native reports um, but the number one said thing he says at the end is remember to call an elder they've been waiting for your call so mm -hmm. everybody was kind of familiar with that you know um, as that's what he would commonly say at the end of his um, informational session um, so it was it was a natural statement and you know dr vineo provided us with that image and that was wonderful um so and the other image is of an elder um, named hank kingbird who um is a well-known um elder um hand drum singer and uh, this was a perfect image um, and we were just really trying to get the the message of protecting our elders is respecting our elders because, 
um, that's a high value in the community. Um, sure. Other things about the the billboards is just making sure the logos were were correct and we had the okay to move forward with the tribal logo and then our agency logo and not making it too complicated with too much information but just enough information so people could um, call if they needed to make a report. Sure, and balancing you know what you need to get out there with not putting too much on there. And it's great that you could use photos of, of people in your community and to use a phrase that they were already familiar with. I think that's brilliant. Really, very nice. All right, and I think I'll turn things back over to Krista. Great, thank you, Andy and Alicia and Robin and Tani. It's really powerful information, and I really appreciate Tani how you um, you stood up a resi resiliency. I think that is really important thing to to remember um, in our in our messaging as well. So. Um, now it's time. We have some time for some some Q and A. Um, I had uh, we have a couple things that came in, but please, uh, if folks have any more questions or comments, please go ahead and send those in now. Um, we had a comment come from um, our colleague uh, Joan from American um, Samoa. Uh, Joan is saying we are in the process of involving the village leaders to be part of our campaign. Um, thanks, Joan. That that is really really important. Um, and uh, both uh, Robin and Tani spoke about the, um, the importance of bringing um, all of your important community members to the table. So thanks for that. And good, good luck and, and check that toolkit out. Um, I, hopefully it'll help. Um, and then Victoria is um, asking a question. She, uh, Victoria is from uh, Massachusetts and Math Massachusetts is a, what we call a bifurcated state meaning that um, they uh, have a separation between the 18 to 59 year old program and the uh, 60 plus program. And so Alicia, um, are the materials available for bifurcated states? Um, so would the messaging be appropriate for an APS program or pr protective services program that focuses on the 18 to 59 population? Yes, we do have um, a disclaimer on the bottom of most of our um, resources because we um, want to take that national approach that it does vary in different states and we remind folks to check in to see what the um, what the what the age um, limitations are in each state. And I mean, and that's another reason why I love reframing so much because then we are really taking that that um, any age approach, right? That all of us um, should be aware of these um, signs of abuse and resources. Great, thank you. And I see some other, um, just a reminder for folks because there are so many wonderful resources shared in live links that the uh, PDF of the slides um, with the links that are live and you can click them and go right to the resources. Um, are in the handout section of your control panel and you can download from there um, and they will be posted also when we post the recording of the webinar. Um, let's see, we have another question that's coming in. Can the speakers give some range of the costs involved in their projects? Thank you, Carol, for that. I am not the budget person, let me... Um... <laughs> we had a set aside amount. Um, I know billboards are very pricey. Um, I have to, you give me two seconds, I can look up something and tell you the range. But I wasn't prepared to answer that question. So I can get back to that person later sure. if they'd like me to. Yeah, sure. Um, Tani, do you have a, a sense of, of uh, the range? This, this was the first time that I've ever worked with a billboard company. So um i learned a lot about it um so they charge you by the panel and then also um for the location and um so what i learned is that we it ended up being um anywhere from like ten thousand to um 14 um to get it all done um and it was we did three installations um, and that included like setting up the artwork and photographs. Um, it was great that the artists that I worked with already had some experience working with the company. So 
they had a good working relationship. So it worked really well because they kind of knew um, kind of, uh, I guess, the standards for setting up a billboard. Thank you. And Krista, if I could just quickly piggyback on that, the, the sure. toolkit, I know we keep coming back to that, but the toolkit that the AP Historic published talks about videos and billboards and brochures, and it actually provides some very rough um, estimates of how much each of those could cost, depending on different scenarios. Um, and I think that, you know, billboards, it often depends on where you live and how many, um, you know, how many people are in the area, but you can get some, some rough estimates for that in our toolkit. Perfect. Thanks, Andy, for refreshing um, my memory. So yes, the toolkit, once again, focusing back on that, that public awareness toolkit. So, um, okay, so let's, oh, yes. Uh -huh. I just wanted to also share too for social media, um, just in case anybody was um, thinking about those ads as well and those price ranges for a 90 day um, campaign, we've, in the past, we've spent less, but this year we spent about $1,000 in it. Garnish, I just had it open, um, about 1.1 million in, um, impressions, which is like people being able to see each one of our ads. So it really went a long way. Okay, so just to be clear, Alicia, you, uh, NCEA invested $1,000 and in you got how many impressions? 1.1 million on just Twitter. Okay, thank you for that. That's that's very helpful information, definitely. So, all right. Um, so it looks like we might be to the end of the questions. Let's go ahead to the next slide. I'll give you a couple, uh, maybe two minutes of your of your time back. Um, I want to thank you, um, thank our presenters, Andy, Alicia, Tani, Robin, and thank you for attending. Great questions, great comments. Um, we hope to see you for the next APS TARC webinar um, in October for culturally responsive APS practice when working with tribal and indigenous communities. We are currently planning this webinar and the registration announcement with a firm date will be sent out in the next couple of weeks through all of the TARC channels. Um, and I also just want to recognize that uh, this is the last TARC webinar for the federal fiscal year. And um, so we wanna celebrate that and celebrate with you. Thank you all for, for joining us throughout this federal fiscal year and um, hope that you come back in October and in November and December for that matter. Um, so thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day and see you next time and uh, take care. Thanks presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.